After months of speculation, the long-anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive appears to be underway. What will count as victory? And on what timetable? Could targets extend as far as Russian-occupied Crimea? My guest this week on Conflict Zone is Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Olha Stefanichina, who oversees Ukraine's integration into the EU and NATO. We uh, have seen a massive losses uh, uh, on the side of the, of the Russian army, which has not been uh, prepared, let's say, uh, for that. What more does she need from partners to future-proof Ukraine's defense? And what does she think might convince Putin that time's up for his invasion? Deputy Prime Minister Stephanie Chena, welcome to Conflict Zone. Greetings, Berlin. Ukraine claims to have already retaken a number of villages amid reports of intense battles along the 600-mile front line with Russia. Are you satisfied with the early stages of the offensive? Uh, thank you for this uh, for this question. Uh, it's um, uh, it's early to make any any forecast, but at this stage, uh, there is a number of things that we can confirm that mostly in Zaporizhia and Kherson uh, region, which are the southern part of Ukraine, Russian Federation is mostly concentrating on defensive measures to keep their uh, their, uh, their their alliance. While uh, in Luhansk and Donetsk region, they are uh, doing the attempts of offensive measures, which has not been a successful over the uh, over the recent days. Um, meanwhile, uh, we face a massive missile attacks throughout the the uh, whole territory of Ukraine and uh, especially on the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, the missile attack over the last night has, uh, in all the directions, uh, been targeted and reached civilian and residential buildings in Zaporizhia, in uh, in uh, uh, Kharkiv, uh, and uh, in uh, Luhansk, um, uh, Luhansk Oblast of uh, of Ukraine, uh, with the people who who died and uh, uh, faced the consequences of airstrikes, and many of them have been uh, wounded. So, uh, uh, additionally to the military and counteroffensive measures will still face uh, a massive consequences of um, uh, airstrikes targeted against civilian population. And, and the counteroffensive, it's a chance to show your Western backers that you can really deliver now on gains. Success will keep the money, the weapons flowing. Is this a must-win moment for Ukraine? Uh, well, first of all, it's not a kind of deal with the Eastern, uh, with the Western world uh, to justify the military support for Ukraine. We have to understand that we're talking about the war, uh, the full-scale war, uh, which is taking place uh, in the center of uh, Europe. So uh, I think that throughout the period of time since uh, the beginning of this year, we did our best to prepare ourselves for a counteroffensive measures which are uh, being uh, implemented to uh, to some extent uh, at this stage. So the first and foremost is to be successful in the battlefield and make sure that Russian armed forces are withdrawn from Ukrainian territory. All the others are um, uh, the the second stage decisions. But I think that itself uh, military support is the major signal to the whole world and our partners that there is a trust and support for Ukraine for our victory. You meet with NATO and EU uh, representatives. What are they telling you? What, what are their expectations? And what are your expectations as Ukrainians? What would count as victory in this counteroffensive? Uh, well, I think it's really important to understand that uh, there is a uh, single and one understanding of the victory, and it's black and white, and it's as clear as uh, in everywhere we have uh, have been reading in uh, history books on the victory. Uh, victory is ending the war with the restoration of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and the restoration of the uh, rules-based order uh, uh, in a different consequences. First, the victory on the battlefield is, uh, uh, is uh, extremely important, and then political settlement, bringing back Russia to responsibility for the crimes, uh, ensuring the compensation and reparation mechanisms, but also making sure that Ukraine is uh, provided with the security guarantees as a part of the new security architecture in Europe. I think that this uh, understanding has not been changing over all 475 days of war and will not change if we have a target to prevent military aggression and to hold those 
who committed the crime uh, accountable. Some analysts are saying that cutting off Crimea from Russia could be terminal to Putin's regime. Is that the best case scenario for this counteroffensive? What can you most realistically achieve in the next days, weeks, maybe even months? Uh, well, experts do not fight the war. Uh, expert do not, experts do not take political decisions, and experts do not bear the historic re uh, responsibility for that. And experts are not dying and suffering from from the uh, from the massive uh, attacks against civilian population. So it's uh, uh, it's always good to have variety of the opinions, but uh, we are sticking first and foremost to the reality. So uh, uh, first and foremost, we are concentrating on a massive um, uh, plans related to uh, to deoccupation of the eastern and southern parts of Ukraine. And following that, we will start planning everything which is needed to end the war militarily and proceed with the political uh, set of decisions which is enshrined in the peace formula of Zelensky, which has already been um, uh, stick to by all 27 EU member states, but also the G7 group. It's expected that the counteroffensive could come at a very high cost for your forces, especially in these early stages. Russia has spent months laying minefields, digging bunkers, setting out concrete barriers for tanks. Is the public prepared for heavy human losses? Are your forces prepared? Uh, I think we should uh, also be clear about uh, a very important element that uh, uh, not military people, civilian population is also massively suffering from the war and the war crimes of the Russian Federation. So the massive long lasting consequences of the explosion uh, on the Kakhovska gas uh, is going far beyond just a uh, watered uh, areas uh, uh, around the Kherson region. It might it is a massive uh, ecological consequences. We do not still able to give a clear assessment on the consequences to the operation of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. We would have a massive uh, uh, massive um, uh, environmental consequences and everything related to a epidemiological situation in Ukraine following uh, the uh, the uh, outflow of the water. And uh, and this is covering uh, thousands and thousands and dozens of thousands of people around Ukraine, not taking uh, families of Ukrainian people who have lost their loved ones, and it's not necessarily only the armed forces. So there is a full consensus uh, among Ukrainian people that if this war is not ending with victory, this would be the war ending Ukraine as a country. And regarding the Kokovka dam collapse that you've been referencing there, how big a setback is that not only for Ukraine, but also for the counteroffensive? How are you seeing it? Uh, well, uh, I'm not the, 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 the military person uh, per se, and uh, I cannot really go into details of, uh, of, the, of the planning uh, settlements. So far, we are fully concentrated on uh, mitigating the consequences of, uh, of uh, uh, this uh, explosion uh, deliberately done by Russian Federation. And uh, we uh, have seen a massive losses uh, uh, on the side of the of the Russian army, which has not been uh, prepared, let's say, uh, for that, uh, which is uh, another uh, witness of the broken chains of command within uh, the armed forces of the Russian Federation and uh, understanding that uh, the life of the human being, the life of the soldier of Russia means nothing to, to the Russians. Elsewhere, I'd like to ask you about Moscow's accusations um, that Ukraine is behind a range of aerial attacks on targets inside of Russia's borders in recent weeks. For example, near the northeastern border in Belgorod, also in Moscow and Russian-occupied Crimea. How much do you or the government know about these incidents? Uh, well, uh, there are like two obvious things that we have to have uh, in our mind. First and foremost, nobody has been hiding behind, uh, let's say, the the, uh, the the operations made on uh, on the territory of the Russian Federation. This is the, a special combat battalion consisting from the citizens of the Russian Federation uh, who named themselves a, a Russian battalion, and the, this is a obvious information. Secondly, uh, it's very important to understand that uh, uh, the worst case scenario for Russian Federation is to admit 
that uh, their own borders are not protected and their own citizens are standing against Russian Federation and uh, that they are not able to control their borders and not able to uh, to mitigate the 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 massive rise of uh, um, uh, of people in the in this area. So Russia would never recognize anything like that, and it would always be Ukraine blamed of that. Uh, to our understanding, is is that of course uh, Ukraine is backing anything like that, but uh, recognizing Ukraine as a as a massive military power prevailing over Russia is the first step towards their defeat. I mean, Ukraine, and you've done just on it there as well, you've denied responsibility for the incursions uh, within Russian territory. But the question is, do you support them? Well, uh, again, I think that the very fact of this occasion taking place on the territory of the Russian Federation and the Russians claiming the responsibilities on Ukraine is the first step towards the defeat of Russia, towards the, the recognition of their incapability in the military and uh, security uh, sense. So for us, it's a, it's, a, it's a good sign of Russian incapability. Zelensky has been doubling down, meantime, on Ukraine's push to join NATO, calling for a strong signal at the NATO summit in Vilnius in July. Um, a clear invitation to Ukraine is what he's calling for. Do you think you'll get it? Uh, well, I, I think that we should understand that at this point, we're not talking about making Ukraine a member of NATO tomorrow. There are like more priority uh, targets that we have here, but having this experience since 2008 in Bucharest summit, we understand that when the counteroffensive is uh, is ending, when the war on the military front is ending, we should be prepared and resilient and resolved in our actions. That's why we should start preparing ourselves for the membership, as it has been confirmed by all uh, 30 allies. And uh, uh, at this stage, what is considered necessary over the Vilnius summit is just a political wording. And it's particularly sad for Ukraine that uh, that 30 allies have a very, very ambiguous position towards putting a political responsibility on taking the actions to confirm that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. And literally, there's no um, uh, there's no uh, any objection for this political invitation to take place. Um, so so then let me stage, ask you. We, so then let me ask you, because, yeah. I mean, here's the words of Zelensky. He, he said recently, how many Ukrainian lives is one sentence at the Vilnius summit worth? What is that one sentence that you want? That one sentence from NATO allies? Ukraine is invited to join NATO and the modalities will be identified, uh, taking into account the security situation. There is, however, in the backdrop, division in NATO on when or how to provide a timetable for NATO membership. Is that also something that you would need to see? Well, this will be a subject for uh, for discussion. Uh, at this stage, we do not even have a legal, uh, a legal format under which there could be a, a place for this discussion. So uh, lack of political commitment is something that we face at this moment. And basically, I think that we're reading this signal as if Putin is, uh, Putin is still sitting over the table of the NATO summit as it was in Bucharest of 2008. And uh, this, uh, any ambiguity on political invitation for Ukraine would be read by Russia as, as a signal that there's still a room for forcing Ukraine to negotiate another Minsk format. And this is not the signal we want to hear. We want leaders to send over the Vilnius summit bilateral security pledges made by individual countries are being floated as a possible step now um, toward Ukraine joining NATO. France recently backed the idea. How do you see those efforts? Is that the best you can hope for? Well, again, we're, we're splitting the, the political process and the actual decisions on Ukraine joining the NATO. It might take some time it would require uh, additional efforts on interoperability, um, uh, t timing uh, on the security situation, ending the war, and etc. Throughout this period, we have to start investing in, in our defense and learning the lessons from the war and preventing Russia from having a hunger with Putin or without him to uh, uh, give the answer to the question that 
any aggression is possible. That's why security guarantees are the major instrument uh, at this stage. It is possible. We have a trustworthy, reliable, strong partners who have been supporting Ukraine militarily. And this support should be on a strategic basis. And this should be a signal also for the defense industries to be able to adjust their production based on this security guarantees, uh, because the war is still lasting. But are security guarantees um, from, from NATO and NATO partners even worth having, even if it's, not, if it's on a collective or an individual basis? I mean, because you've had assurances before. I'm thinking back, you know, 1994, 2008, and it appears to have meant nothing. Well, uh, there's been a declarations, but not the guarantees. Uh, so, uh, and the declaration is not something that is needed because we have plenty of them already at the various uh, uh, at the various stages. But security guarantees is uh, again about strengthening Ukraine defense capacity, sustainable and massive military support for a long period of time based on the uh, on the targets of strengthening Ukraine's air defense, land forces, and other elements of that. And massive, uh, uh, massive engagement um, uh, through military defense uh, support, but also uh, immediate political response in case of uh, uh, another act of aggression based on the lessons we've already learned from this war. Earlier this year, and I'd like to... Um turn now to Ukraine's EU ambitions as well. Um, earlier this year, the prime minister said um, that he had set what he called an ambitious goal of Ukraine joining the EU in two years. Is it fair for Ukraine and the Ukrainian prime minister to expect the EU to grant membership that quickly? Uh, well, um, uh, uh, what he meant by, the, by his message is that we will be ready for that as a country. So uh, we're taking it as a homework of uh, restructuring or reorienting uh, our uh, way of life or our operation based on the ambition of becoming a member of the EU, uh, a fully fledged part of the single market, a contributor to the single market and EU economy. So that would require a massive legal and regulatory adjustment. So to our understanding and our planning cycle is up to two years to make sure that we're capable to, to, to join the EU. And for that, we expect that by the end of the year, European leaders will take um, another and I would say the last political decision to open the accession talks to align our accession process with the reconstruction and financial support to that regard. But but, you know, there are some reports um, that are coming in uh, that some EU capitals have privately chastised both Ukrainian officials for um, expecting the process to be completed in rapid time and the bloc's leadership as well for encouraging those hopes. When you throw out timetables like two years, aren't, aren't you raising false hopes among your public? Uh, well, again, we're talking about two years to uh, build our own preparedness for uh, for membership. And it's really important. And it is the way it is communicated uh, to people. Um, uh, there is a, a very big difference between NATO and, and, uh, and EU accession. On EU accession, uh, people in Ukraine, 91 percent of population supporting that, they understand that it is already a formal process. It is well communicated. It's well controlled by civil society. So there is a huge leverage of knowledge in that regard, a part of the support itself. So uh, I think that the major uh, target for us is to make sure that we are competitive, strong and capable member of European Union and that our economies are only benefit from that. So at this stage, we need to launch the accession talks to be able to uh, to have these negotiations. And uh, at this stage for us, it's really important that it would be a pure and technocratic negotiations process without uh, delays, political delays, and et cetera. So much work has to be done, um, including further measures against corruption, tightening laws against money laundering, um, and the excessive influence of Ukraine's wealthy oligarchs. How do you expect to effectively do so during a full-scale invasion a war situation, it usually increases, for example, the risk of corruption. Well, I, I wouldn't agree uh, in, in the very fact that it is increases the risk of corruption. It, it has the very opposite effect that all the instruments we've enshrined into our legal and institutional system, they are now fully operational, uh, operational but they are also backed up by uh, zero 
tolerance to any corruption in times of war, especially if it comes to the uh, to the administrative services or everything related to the functioning of, of the state. So it has really an opposite effect. Uh, let's turn back to your defense, uh, to your security, uh, which relies on billions in aid from, from Western partners and also equipment. It's been said that the U.S. and European countries have drawn down their own stocks without a clear plan to sustain high levels of military aid thereafter. Partners right now also facing energy crisis, soaring costs of living among their own domestic populations. How high is the risk that support at these levels might not hold? Uh, well, that's part of the answer to the question we've been discussing before on the security guarantees. This is exactly the substance of the security guarantees enshrining the bilateral engagement to develop Ukraine defense, but also to give a strategic understanding on the European and your Atlantic defense industry to make sure that the military support is sustainable and strategic. Most worrying is the potential for U.S. support to wane, um, increasing uncertainty about whether it can match its existing levels of aid and equipment um, is currently being discussed, given a divided Congress, a presidential election next year, where some leading Republican candidates have said the war is a territorial issue. How devastating would a dip in U.S. support be for your defense? Uh, well, uh, indeed, we understand that the, their uh, Congress might be divided on some issues, but it has never been divided on issues related to Ukraine, Ukraine territorial integrity, sovereignty, Ukraine's aspirations, regardless the name uh, of the president of the United States. So we have always had a strong bipartisan support. And at this stage, uh, we do uh, a strong and coordinated efforts with the White House and Department of Defense uh, in terms of of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, sustainable planning of the military supports, packages of military supports and financial support. But uh, there's nothing that could signal to us that basically this bipartisan support of Ukraine will be undermined by any other elements of turbulence. But we have to say, I mean, just last week, for example, President Biden said that he believed, and he used that word believed, the U.S. would have the funding to support Ukraine as long as it takes, saying that he believes it, it doesn't sound as confident as the U.S. used to be. Well, uh, he made the statement, and uh, just today we have uh, the announcement from the uh, from the U.S. about mobilization of another package of the military support. And of course, it's not uh, looking the way as uh, if uh, Ukraine uh, uh, Ukrainian officials are sitting in Kiev and waiting for for the announcement. This is a daily job which has been done in coordination with the with the White House and Department of Defense. So we have a very clear strategic perspective in that regard, and we do not have any reasons to consider that it will be changing. Former French President Francois Hollande has said the following. Um, he said that the way the war ends might depend on the outcome of the 2024 U.S. presidential election, and that, I'm quoting here, if Trump is elected, he will say, we stop here, whatever the Russians have, they can keep, the war cost too much. Time is not on your side in this war, is it? Uh, yes, and, and uh, the elections are taking place uh, autumn next year, but now we're in the summer of 2023, and we're, uh, we're in, a, in a beginning of the massive um, counteroffensive uh, measures. This is the first thing. But I think the, the most important thing that uh, why would the whole world be mobilized to, uh, democratic world, to be mobilized to support Ukraine? Because... Uh, the whole world understands that we're standing for the democratic values, but the very important thing that it is Ukrainians who were fighting, will be fighting with their bare hands. And this is Ukrainians who were standing for 175 days of the three-day war. And uh, it's understanding that military support allows us to save our people to save our armed forces and to be capable on a battlefield and sophisticated and building the NATO standard itself. So, uh, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, put uh, an equal sign between the military support and, and the victory in the war because uh, the whole world stands with Ukraine, knowing that Ukraine will find, will fight with any means we have for our independence and sovereignty, and that is clear to everybody. You were on this program last year, the morning after Putin ordered troops into Ukraine, beginning the invasion. Um, 
And I'd just like to ask you, did you expect, did you imagine more than a year ago the extent of the conflict, the time, the damage, the casualties? Well, we've learned a lot throughout this period. And we are now uh, living our lives knowing that we are ready for anything. And uh, living under the threat of uh, living under the nuclear blackmail on a daily basis um, also gives the sense of a bit different reality. We are ready for anything. Deputy Prime Minister Stefanichina, thank you so much for joining us on Conflict Zone. Thank you.